Taya Budu, who will be talking about what happens when you give your career to science. Let's give her a big hand. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everyone. I'm here to tell you what happens when you donate your career to science. Brad just introduced me. Um, thank you for pronouncing my name correctly. It's Taya with a secret H. I write a blog called Futurist Naturalist, and I write about a lot of things that I'm going to be talking about here. So if you want to learn more about them, you can check that out. I don't tell a lot of people this next one, um, but I'm actually an art school dropout. I was a sophomore when I got my first job in an ad agency, and I was like, it's your school. <laughs> so I um, got an associate's degree, but I never finished a bachelor's, and that'll be relevant later. I've been doing content strategy since about 2009. And I worked on a few clients that you might recognize. But most importantly, I've been a science fan since 1987. And that was when I told my parents that I was going to be a paleontologist. I was three years old. Now, just a little disclaimer. I am talking about careers in science today. And my example of a career is content strategy. And my example of a science is going to be paleontology, which is the study of ancient life in Earth's past. And those aren't necessarily representative of all careers and all sciences, but I have tried really hard to draw some general conclusions and find the most surprising things that I learned about science and academia and how that whole system works that I would have been surprised to hear about before I jumped into it. So real quick, I can't see you too well, but raise your hand if you have a friend or family member who's a professional scientist, or maybe you are one yourself. OK. Awesome. Maybe a little more than I expected. Um, you guys are all way ahead of where I was four years ago when I presented UX for Aliens here at Web Visions 2012. And this is the last time I was um, at Web Visions. I'm really excited to be back, by the way. Um, I wrote it up as a blog post. So if you want to actually learn more about that and what, a little bit of what Brad told you, you can check it out at that link. And around that time in my life, in 2012, I felt a little bit like this um, Quetzalcoatlus up here. I was maybe a little bit gloomy, and I um, didn't really know what I was doing with myself, although I had this great position in content strategy at a great ad agency, and I was doing some really cool projects, but I felt like there's something that I had sort of left behind. And I spent a lot of my time reading about science stuff and talking about new planets and dinosaurs with my coworkers and annoying them at happy hour with all my geeky things. And um, I really started thinking, you know, OK, I obviously am really a little more into this than most people. And I want to see if I can take this farther. I want to see if maybe I can offer my services professionally to science somehow. And I found three major barriers to that. I spent about a year, actually, looking for jobs and researching science communication and actually applying for things while I was still working. <laughs> and um, I discovered that I didn't really know any scientists, so I didn't really have any good way to learn first or second hand about what it really took to do that. And I didn't have anyone to introduce me to anybody. And I didn't have a degree in science or a bachelor's degree at all which turned out to be an issue when it's a job that doesn't rely on a portfolio. And I wasn't focused on a particular science. Now, <laughs> imagine you come to a place like Web Visions, and you're like, hey, guys, I'm a really big internet fan. <laughs> Give me a job. <laughs> it's not really going to get you very far. So I had to focus in on a particular science and actually sort of start to know about something a little bit. So I focused in on paleontology because I'd always loved it. And actually, it was a little bit harder of a decision than you'd think. I really considered content strategy, but I mean, um, cognitive science, because it really is related to content strategy. But I focused on a paleontology. And I decided to go to a conference, and I thought I should probably go back to school. So the conference I chose was the annual meeting of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. Now, when I got here, I had. Um, I'd actually cashed out my 401k to be able to come. I had to fly cross country because I was living in Baltimore at the time, and the conference was in Los Angeles. And I booked a hotel for the week, and I signed up for all of the workshops and all of the field trips. 
at paleontology conferences, you get to go on field trips. And um, I got to the hotel bar, actually, the night before it really kicked off, because I'd heard some rumors on Twitter that people might be meeting up there. So I got in, and I was feeling really shy. I was totally alone. I didn't know anybody. Um, I never met a paleontologist. I didn't know what I was looking for. They don't all look alike, of course, but um, I didn't. <laughs> I, um, I had a couple of drinks, and finally I kind of just turned around, and there was a table full of people over here, and I walked up, and I just sort of blurted out, are any of you guys paleontologists? And they all stared at me. And the guy who was sitting closest to me pulled up a chair, and he poured me a beer. And he was the first paleontologist that I met. And the rest of the conference went a little bit like that. I was really welcomed. I was surprised to find just how excited everyone was to talk about what they did, even though I was a total noob. And um, it was also Halloween, so there was a little bit of a party atmosphere, and people were dressing up. <laughs> Another Quetzalcoatl has showed up. <laughs> um, and I met a lot of people. Now, throughout this talk, I really wanted so much to share with you all the amazing projects that I came across that people were doing, and the incredible scientists and researchers and people on the edge of science and research who were just doing incredible things, and I want to talk about their research and their cool projects. I don't have time. <laughs> I would have to introduce you to a really long line of people. So I have to skip over a lot of these, but if you see something in here that catches your eye, I can tell you about their story later if we meet up at the um, after party or just after. Um, I am going to tell you about two from this list. One of the first people I really got to talk to was a technical writer, and we were sharing a bus ride on the field trip, so we had a long conversation. And I think we really connected, because she was a technical writer, and I was a, a writer, a copywriter, and we kind of had that in common, but also she was a working professional who was involved with paleontology, and she was a little farther down this path than I was, so I found that pretty exciting. And she told me how she volunteered as a fossil preparator at a local lab. And I found out, this is a new concept for me, that one of the activities in paleontology is fossil preparation, and that's when you take the bones out of the, after they've come out of the field and they're still in rock or covered with rock or dirt, somebody has to clean them and prepare them. And it can be very careful, diligent work because fossils can be very fragile. And it's also very important for making them presentable for display and useful for research. And I didn't realize that that was something you could do as a volunteer in your free time. And the other person I met was at the poster session. Now, at an academic conference, this was also totally new to me, they have a poster session where a researcher will get their research presented on a literal poster that they print out, and it goes up on a, on a board, and they stand by it, and everyone else grabs a beer and walks around and asks questions. And at this conference, I was walking around with a beer and asking questions of the people with their posters. And one of the posters I found had some dinosaur bones on it that had been chewed up a little bit by some kind of little animals. I think they were beetles, but they might have been snails. And um, I started talking to the researcher about it, and I asked her about the dinosaur. And she looked at me a little bit shyly, and she admitted, well, <laughs> I'm actually an invertebrate paleontologist, so I don't really know anything about the dinosaur. I studied the beetles. <laughs> and I found out um, from her and from many other examples like that over that week just how diverse the field of paleontology was. And I thought this was a pretty obscure field. It's a subset of maybe biology or geology, which is already a subset of science. So paleontology was pretty specific, and this gets, this gets really, really specific. There's so many subfields and so many diverse things to research in this. And I feel like that applies pretty well generally to every science field. If you go to one of these conferences and you start really meeting the people who are working on this stuff firsthand, you're going to hear so many things that just don't turn up in the news websites and the social media blogs that you end up um, reading in your free time. It's going to be really surprising. Now, I left this conference having learned more in one week about paleontology than I had in the previous 29 years of my life. And keep in mind that 26 of those years had been spent being a big paleontology fan. So that was really amazing. Um, I also joined the web committee and did a little bit of volunteer work for them over the next couple of years. And I left 
Most importantly, having met a lot of people, which was my goal, and made some friends. And with the feeling that I had made the right choice and that there maybe was a place for me in this community. And I was excited to find it. Now, while I was there, I got an email from Drexel University where I'd applied to their geoscience program to finish my bachelor's degree. And I got an email saying that I'd been accepted. And I was pretty excited. And I went to Philadelphia, and I spent a lot of time in this building at Drexel. Now, up that spiral staircase on the side, on the top floor, you'll find the paleontology lab. And I spent a lot of my time there, every time that I could. This is me in the lab. Um, that's my dad on the side. Hi, dad. <laughs> and that's, um, in the middle between us is the bone of a giant dinosaur called Dreadnoughtus. Now, this dinosaur was published that same year. And this, the discoverer of the dinosaur was the head of the department, Ken Lacavara, who has now moved to Rowan University. And behind my dad, I think that's actually a scapula, which is a shoulder bone. This is a huge, huge animal. The vertebrae, actually, the backbones were spread all over the coffee table, like as big as this thing here, almost. A huge, absolutely a huge dinosaur. Um, so I was really, really excited just to be in the same room as this thing. And I also, fun fact, got to dissect a dinosaur while I was at Drexel. Um, you probably have heard by now that all birds are technically classified as dinosaurs nowadays, and a pigeon is pretty closely related to Velociraptor. That's going to be mentioned later, too. And um, I want to tell you so much about pigeons right now. They've got air sacs and crop milk and all kinds of crazy stuff. Ask me about them later. <laughs> um, at Drexel, again, the people were just so helpful. And I met so many people doing amazing projects. And I don't have time at all to talk about any of them, really. But I will tell you one. Um, Ken Lacavara, who I mentioned, was the head of the department there. And this is a man who had just discovered a giant dinosaur in Argentina, brought it back to the US, and was about to publish it. And it was a, one of the major paleontology finds of the decade. And this was like a peak career moment for him. But he liked to have a one-on-one -on -one with each of his geoscience students. And when it was my turn, he was thrilled to find out that I was of legal drinking age, <laughs> unlike most of his students. So he went to the wine bar across the street. And over a couple glasses of wine, I told him pretty much my whole story. I'd been working in ad, ag in ad agencies and kind of secretly wishing I'd been a paleontologist and um, wondering, now that I was actually on this path, where it was going to go and feeling kind of uncertain about what my real career prospects were and what was going to happen. And he told me that even though he was this um, really successful paleontologist, sometimes he wished that he'd become a drummer and he'd actually been playing drums his whole life, and sometimes he could still be found up on a stage behind a drum set. And that was sort of his passion. So it was very eye-opening and really comforting also to me to discover that someone who had the thing that I dreamed about wanting also himself wanted something else. Now, I didn't end up finishing that bachelor's degree. <laughs> And it turns out that the financial aid system isn't really designed for married high-income art school dropouts. And I'm totally a crazy edge case. Probably none of you really have that problem. But um, I wasn't able to finish. I exhausted all the possible avenues of that. And Drexel's a very expensive school. So I left, but I left with a lot of experience and an ongoing relationship with everyone I met there. And now I mentioned Ken Lacavara is at Rowan University, and I've been doing some work with them as well. But the main thing I got out of this was a project called Rotatious Mantua. Now, Mantua Township is a little suburb in New Jersey, just outside of Philadelphia. And if you go into Mantua Township, back behind a little random strip mall, you're going to find a pit of sand. <laughs> and in the sand, there's one layer that's called the main fossiliferous layer. It's a very creative name. And that layer, of course, is filled with fossils. And the layer actually dates to the very end of the time of dinosaurs. It's the end of the Cretaceous period. That's why I called it Cretaceous Mantua. And if you were there at that time in this random back lot in New Jersey, you would have been underwater. It would have been a warmer, calmer Atlantic Ocean. And off sh on the shore, there would have been mangrove forests. So it would have felt a bit like scuba diving off the coast of Florida, except that you'd be chased by giant mosasaurs and probably eaten pretty fast, because it was the time of dinosaurs. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I did get to go out there and spend some time in the field. And um, I didn't really dig up any mosasaurs, but I got some clams. <laughs> and uh, we brought a lot of those fossils back to the lab. And I spent a lot of my time in the lab helping to catalog these fossils. Now, it worked a bit like this. I would have the fossils in a box and then a binder. And the binder was full of printouts of illustrations of the different fossils that were known already from the quarry. And another binder here. So I would take a fossil and then find the corresponding illustration and identify it and then record it in the other binder. And maybe it sounds a little bit dull unless you're super into um, fossils like I was. And I was, I was really into it, actually. I was so excited to finally be doing real paleontology, even though it, it maybe seemed a little bit dull. Um, I was thrilled. But after a little while, I also realized that it was a content strategy challenge. And so I made a website. <laughs> now, I put this together in WordPress so that other people could use it pretty easily, too. And actually, I used WordPress for all of the projects I did because it was easy for other people to get the hang of on the back end. And um, I tweaked the CSS a little bit, and I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> you already know all that web stuff. So <laughs> what I did was put each of the animals that had been in that binder into this website. And each one got its own page. And all the information that was known about them got collected in there. And I also wrote a lot about the ecosystem and what was known about it, the bit I told you about being off the coast of Florida, but in New Jersey. And the goal of this was twofold. It was really useful for the researchers in the lab to be able to have all the information they needed in one place and to be able to identify these organisms. It's also pretty handy for onboarding, so new people to the project could get a hang of it pretty fast. But it's also a public outreach tool. And this was something that I cared a lot about because most of my career has been spent creating things for the public. And it's something I knew how to do. And it's also something that Ken LaCavara cared a lot about, too, and still does. Um, so we designed this specifically so that it would be written in a way that was intelligible for the public, so that they could get a feel for what the science was all about without having to cross-reference stuff. And so that any kid in New Jersey could find out what his backyard was like 65 million years ago. And this was a science public outreach project. It was my first one. And I want to tell you a little bit about science public outreach, because it shaped everything else that came afterward. Now, science public outreach can include websites like that one, or talks like the one I'm giving now, exhibits, um, videos, et cetera. And here I am in this picture. I'm actually at a museum in Philadelphia, literally showing people the science. We had the fossils out on a table, and I was talking to them about it. So it can be pretty handy for recruiting new scientists. That's pretty obvious. But it also informs public policy. And that's really important because you might have noticed that public policy isn't always informed by science the way that it should be. It also helps improve scientific literacy of the general public. And that's really important, not just so that voters can make good decisions, but also so that you and me can make good decisions when we try to buy our houses, or if companies are trying to build a building there's a town south of where I live now in San Francisco called Pacifica, and there's houses that are literally falling into the ocean uh, because they built them on a sandy cliff that's eroding. And a little bit of science public outreach might have gone along the way there. I'm going to share three quotes with you that I really like about science public outreach that I think give a good trifecta of the current state of it and its importance. Any researcher receiving a National Science Foundation grant must explain how their research will affect the public, including plans for outreach. Now, this was a little bit new to me. I learned that the National Science Foundation is the organization that gives out a whole lot of the grant money for scientific research in the US. And the fact that they are now requiring scientists to tell them how they're going to outreach to the public before they give them money to do their research is a big shift in how science is being done. And it's really important to note that. It's been increasing since the 90s. Scientists, here's the bottom line. If you don't convince the public that your science matters, your funding will quickly vanish and so will your field. This sounds a little bit dire, but there's some troubling trends in politics to start calling out um, cherry picking science projects and making them sound frivolous as an example of wasteful spending. And you hear about this sometimes in the news. And it's really troubling a lot of scientists because politicians are able to twist 
what they're really doing into something that meets their own ends. And it's costing them jobs. And they're going to kind of pissed off about it. Now, this one's from Ken Lacavara. And I really like this one. <laughs> the dinosaurs died in the world's fifth mass extinction. Right now, our species is propagating an environmental disaster of geological proportions that is so broad and so severe, it can rightly be called the sixth extinction. Only unlike the dinosaurs, we can see it coming. And unlike the dinosaurs, we can do something about it. Now, I took this public outreach project, Cretaceous Mantua, and I presented it at the annual meeting of the Geological Society of America, we called it GSA. And you might wonder, how do you get to present a website at a scientific conference? Well, a lot like when I suggested the idea for this talk to Web Visions, there was an abstract involved. Um, it was submitted and it was accepted. accepted. But unlike the one for Web Visions, this one was a little, written a little bit differently. It's called Development of an Online Database for Cretaceous Marine Taxa from the KPG Hornerstown Formation of New Jersey. And for me, as an advertising copywriter, this was one of my biggest challenges, was trying to write in this very, very different way. And I realized doing this, now before I had started this deep dive into science, I had really thought that this kind of writing was insane, it was really bad, it was needed to be changed, it should be more friendly, and I really looked down on it. But when I started getting into this myself, I realized that there's reasons it's like that. And scientists are very wary of anything that seems overly opinionated or like it might have an agenda or like it might be advertising or like it might be really biased. And there's a really good reason for that and that's because science is the one institution that we have whose explicit purpose is to give us objective, unbiased information. And so I accepted that and I took on this challenge which was one of the bigger copywriting challenges of my life and wrote this abstract and it was accepted. And this is what I presented. I've got the um, physical poster and also the website was being demoed, it was an earlier version. Now, this time around, I was the person standing in front of the poster at the academic conference and other people were walking around with their beers asking questions. And I was kind of surprised, actually, at the reaction to my poster. Now, I went to art school and I thought for sure, like, I've got this. I've got plenty of white space, I did my typography right, everything's current, the logo's full res. And no one really cared. <laughs> it turns out, if you can see the posters in the background here, they're hard to see, but they're really information dense. There's no white space. The paragraphs are super thick and full of tiny words. And actually, when you get close up, some of them have pixelated logos, which I was dismayed by, but no one else cared. Well, the scientists who come to these things are looking for two things mostly when they're walking around with their beers. They're scanning these posters for key words or maybe images of things that are directly related to their own research. And they're looking for the names of people who they've either worked with in the past or want to collaborate with in the future. And that was a very important realization for me, thinking about scientists as a target market. Now, this was an awesome conference, um, but the, the cool thing that lasted for me from it was actually just a little bit of information that I heard. I think I even saw it on a flyer. And it was about the GeoCore America Geoscientists in the Parks program. Now this program has two names because it's made by two different organizations. It's a collaboration between the GSA, the Geological Society, and the National Park Service. And the goal of this program is to get early career geoscientists working in the national parks in short programs, about 12 weeks, and giving them some experience and making sure that they're doing a little bit of good for the Department of Interior. <laughs> and um, I didn't really think of myself as an early career geoscientist. I was still a mid-career content strategist. But I played around with the idea anyway, and finally I looked through the different positions, and I applied for one at Dinosaur National Monument. Now, I really wanted the word dinosaur in my resume, I'll admit it. <laughs> but I also had, this place had a little bit of a soft spot for me, because I'd been there as a kid, I don't know why I look so angry in this picture. I think my dad was telling me to look ferocious because it was a dinosaur. But um, I came back and I was really excited to be able to spend 12 weeks in this awesome place. Now, this is Carnegie Quarry. And this is the reason Dinosaur National Monument was founded over 100, 101 years ago this year. Um, this doesn't even give you a sense of scale. 
the little, the railing over here, that comes up about here on me. And this is two stories high. And if I was to turn around from the angle I took this photo at, it goes as far back the other direction. So it's absolutely enormous. And it's filled with about 1,500 dinosaur bones. Um, over 100 years ago, a paleontologist was walking through these uh, ridges in Utah near the Colorado border and found a dinosaur bone. And he kept digging. And then he found 5,000 more dinosaur bones. And the Carnegie Museum helped him excavate those, some of them. And that's why it's called the Carnegie Quarry. They decided to leave the last 1,500 in there and make it a national monument. And I'm really glad they did, and a lot of people are, because it's been a really invaluable resource for science. And it's also been a great public outreach tool. The public comes here, lots and lots of people every year, including me in 1997. And they really leave with a sense of history and a sense of scale and a sense of just the magnitude of the history of Earth and our place in it. It's really a cool place and hard to put into words how you feel when you look at it. But a little bit of that feeling we wanted to catch in a digital form, if we could. This was the brainchild of Dan Churry, who is the park paleontologist at Dinosaur National Monument. It's called the Digital Quarry Project. The dinosaurs back here are apatosauruses, which were discovered there, so I thought they'd make a good background. And um, his vision was to get, get that wall of bones online so that anyone all over the world could take a look at those fossils, not just for research and scientific purposes, but to get a little bit of that feeling I tried to describe. And I came out there to work on this as the second, part of the second set of interns. There were four of us, me and the three actual early career geoscientists. And um, the summer before, someone had gotten started doing an illustrator document that had outlines of a lot of the fossils. And so I had something to work with. And when he described this vision to me, even though he thought it would really take years and that he didn't really expect interns to be able to put this together over our summer, we were going to be doing mostly archiving, I thought, you know, OK. I know I'm a content strategist, and I don't really know that technical level to be able to really pull this off. But I know some HTML and CSS, and I can probably put together some kind of prototype so you can at least build some momentum on this. This is a new way of thinking for him, completely new. So I took that Illustrator file, and I was able to export it as an SVG and finagle it into an interactive quarry. And I took 551 of the total 5,000 that we want to eventually have in there. And this is live now. The whole website is carnegiecory.com. You click on a bone, and you get a window. <laughs> this was really hard for me. <laughs> um, but I made it happen. And I helped the other uh, interns that summer do most of the work on the rest of the website. And we were able to not only archive way more than we thought was possible, because we started using an app called Cam Scanner instead of the flatbed scanners, but we also uh, got it online, and again, I used WordPress, and I did a little bit of CSS uh, finagling for this and picked out a theme. And actually, one of the interns had taken a graphic design class, and she did the logo, and another one had been in a journalism club, and he was really excited to write a lot of the articles. So I really let them carry the bulk of the content on this website and just guided them along the way for information architecture, basic web design stuff, metadata, that kind of stuff. And they were just fantastic. I can't say enough good things about how much of a fantastic web development team we made on this project. And everyone was pretty surprised at how much we were able to do. But I wasn't surprised that it was possible at all. In fact, I figured with 12 weeks, probably most of you in this room could do a much better job. And it made me think, this is probably not unique to paleontology or geoscience. There's probably programs like this in other fields that are intended for junior scientists. But they're sometimes used to fund projects that actually need professional creative help that junior scientists aren't necessarily equipped for. And if they did try and get equipped for it and really learn what they, needed, what they need to execute that fully, they probably um, wouldn't really have, find that useful in their careers. And I found that with the people I was working with, that when it came to the more complex stuff, they weren't super interested because they knew it just wasn't going to be useful to them later. Now, again, the people I met 12 weeks in a national park, it was going to be interesting. Um, and I have a lot of stories. But I'm only going to tell you about one. I met a paleontologist from Mongolia 
named Ballor Minjin, and she was there visiting with her family. And we talked a little bit about what she was doing over the course of an evening while she was there. But it wasn't until later that we met up and really talked shop. And um, it was after I left Dinosaur, I was sort of broke, and I went back into advertising. I was freelancing in Manhattan. And she works at the American Museum of Natural History, right by Central Park. So we met up in Koreatown for noodles. And we started talking about paleontology. And she told me about a quarry that she has a project going on with called the Flaming Cliffs. And this is actually a really famous quarry for paleontologists. It's here in Mongolia. Mongolia is above China. And um, it's very famous among paleontologists because it's actually the first place where dinosaur fossil nests were discovered with fossilized dinosaur eggs. So it's a really cool place. And there's also velociraptors there. This one's a velociraptor. And um, it's interesting that what she told me about it, it's really a good opportunity for public outreach because the people who live there, they didn't have a lot of science education. And it is a great irony here that right next to one of the most famous fossil quarries in the world, a very important scientific place, there's people living who don't really know anything about dinosaurs at all. So she proposed this website to me. And this isn't even kind of done yet, but we're getting, we're getting there. There's not going to be a parade of protoceratopses. We're going to have different dinosaurs. There's several kinds. Actually, we just got um, some concept art last week that I'm really excited. It's going to get fleshed out over the next few weeks. And another portion of this is to actually, because there's no museum there, and one of the goals eventually of this project is to build a museum there. We're going to be taking a mobile museum back out there to the Gobi. Now, last summer, this is one of the cool things that she told me about. She had taken this bus that was constructed by the American Museum of Natural History, converted into a literal museum. You go inside, and there's exhibits and dinosaur fossils. And she drove it out to the Gobi Desert and uh, took it to the Flaming Cliffs and got to teach the kids who live there and their parents about dinosaurs. Now this kid, this is kind of a fun story, she told me that he actually wanted to take his horse inside the museum with him, but she wouldn't let him. <laughs> so we got to translate that website into Mongolian. I did think it was interesting that they do have internet out there, although they don't have much science education. Everyone's got a cell phone, and everyone's got a smartphone these days. So that was pretty cool. And we're going to translate that website into Mongolian so that they can start to learn about it and take the mobile museum out there. We're going to do some digital archiving, because there's a lot of history around this website, and none of it's publicly available. And uh, in order to do that, we're going to need to do a little bit of crowdfunding, probably. So if you want to help out, definitely stay in touch. And I've got one more project I want to tell you about. But before I do, I'm going to talk to you about some of the bigger things about the state of creative and science collaboration. And when I say creative, I mean everyone who creates things for a living, so web developers, web designers, copywriters like me. This is what I found out. Um, why scientists aren't working with people like us more often? Scientists who put a lot into public outreach are sometimes looked down on by their peers. They may not realize that they can, and they don't know how to find us or who we are. They haven't quantified how much faster and more efficient their outreach could be if they collaborated with a professional. They don't realize that a project a science student could do in a year, we could and probably would do in a month in our free time. They may perceive the idea of professional web design as flashy and expensive. They prefer their collaborators to have a degree in their field. And a shortage of science jobs motivates them to keep the work within their circle, especially if it pays. So given those really real barriers, why do scientists work with people like us ever? And I tried to collect some of that information as well. Now, as I mentioned, most grants require public outreach. So there's no shortage of projects. We do fantastic work, as you guys all know, quickly and in a professional manner. And we tend to think of things that they don't. We also know how to make them feel listened to, because we work with clients all the time. And they eventually realize, after working with us, that we're experts at learning new things fast. So we don't necessarily need a degree in their field in order to create something for the public any more than we need a business degree to do public outreach for companies, which is what we do all the time. 
This brings me to my ongoing and sort of slow moving project, but I'm very excited about it. Um, Creatives for Science. Now, this came from two core discoveries. Science public outreach benefits enormously from the help of creative professionals. And tons of creative professionals think science is awesome and really want to help. And I found this out on my four years of going on my science journey that um, not only were there people on the same path as me, who I would meet occasionally, who were really going through a lot of effort, and some of them were actually were, were successful at finishing bachelor's degrees and becoming scientists, but um, there were also people who I'd worked with and friends that I had who just thought this was really cool and wanted to do something similar but weren't necessarily willing to go through the crazy extremes that I did. So I created this in part for them and in part for you if you're interested in something like this as well. It's called Creatives for Science. I have a splash page right now. Like I said, um, this is brand new for me. You guys are actually the very first people I've told us about publicly beyond my own group. So there's not much there now. But to give you an idea, these are some projects that have come to me totally unsolicited that I just didn't have time for. And they're part of the incentive that I had for getting this off the ground. I'm also going to be doing a lot of work reaching out to scientists and going to more science conferences and letting them know that this is a resource that's available to them and what the benefits might be for their public outreach and its effectiveness from working with us. So should you donate your career to science? I'm not going to say yes right away. First, I want you to consider the drawbacks, and these are pretty real. I made it sound like it was a whole boatload of fun, but there was a lot of heartbreak and um, a lot of really hard work and trouble. It was a lot of fun, though. Um, even when they have grant money, Zion's public outreach projects don't pay what you're used to. You have to think of them more like volunteer work or do them between higher paying freelance jobs, which is what I've been doing. If the project requires travel or full-time hours, like the one I did at Dinosaur, your job is not going to go for it, and your family may not support it either, because you're going to be taking time away from them for basically no money. <laughs> and maybe you're just not into science, which is fine. I can't really help you there. <laughs> but if you are, and you can do it, definitely do it, because science really needs our skills right now. Science doesn't have a lack of scientists. There's plenty of scientists. Don't quit your web job and become a scientist. The problem is a lack of funding, and a lack of jobs for scientists, and a lack of public support for science. And we can help all of those things because we're really good at creating things that make people want to do stuff and make people want to fund things. <laughs> so this is where we're needed in science, is in public outreach. And I hope that you'll join me on this. I hope to see you sign up at my website. <laughs> I want to thank a lot of people who were on this journey, um, who I met, and who really have amazing projects of their own. And I wish I could share all of them with you, but please check them out in your, in your free time. And I want to thank Web Visions very much for having me back here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>